Hello everybody, welcome back to Smart Robots Review. So last year I was at the NASA Kennedy Space Center to witness the SpaceX launch of the TESS satellite. And while I was there, I got to talk to AJ Nick from one of the founding roboticists of the Swampworks Lab. They are developing great future technology for space exploration, including Razor. And if you haven't watched that episode about Razor, R-A-S-S-O-R, Razor is an innovative robotic concept of a mining robot that can operate on Mars and on the moon. The purpose, the design, the thinking behind all these robots is that in the future we're going to be sending, in the very near future, we may be sending robots like this to collect soil and other nutrients from the ground. And that soil will be used by other robots to build structures, to create an infrastructure when we visit. And to keep the innovation going, NASA has been organizing the Robotic Mining Competition, now known as the Luna Botics Competition, which tasks teams from around the world, 50 in fact, to create concepts like this for future exploration and mining. Now, imagine my excitement when I got to meet one of those teams. The Milwaukee School of Engineering happened to be at the 50th anniversary celebration, Apollo mission celebration at the Discovery World Museum in Milwaukee when I visited a couple of weeks ago and I got to talk to them. They got to show me their robotic concept and discuss the competition itself. All right, so without any further delay, I'm going to stop talking and I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to Smart Robots Review. Our project is sponsored by NASA and we compete at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, so we're making a robot that is um, supposed to mine in a simulated Martian or lunar environment. We're really building this robot to dig below the topsoil, a really sandy, um, dusty environment and get really down into the deep hole, which is where all the water, which is in the form of ice, is kind of held. And so the main kind of goal of this competition is to see different designs of robots, kind of as a re request for proposals for NASA, to see, hey, what robots kind of work on Mars, on the moon, wherever, right. to get water, which we need to make a habitat on Mars. The robot that we have here is in its second year of development. The first year was mainly focused on mechanical and get working out all the kinks mechanically, physically. And this upcoming year, we're actually going to start developing more kind of more autonomous program electronics and like kind of working out the kinks in electrons and in kind of up in the cloud, not necessarily down on the robot. Um, we're also going to start development of our next mechanical robot this upcoming year. So we're kind of doing a staggered development cycle of one year we do mechanical and the electrical controls for the previous robot, as well as like we're developing a new, we're kind of like working, kind of taking two steps at a time, if that okay. makes sense. Because it helps, we're working on mechanical stuff and we're not taking away time from our controls teams who need a lot more time to really develop like complex control systems. Okay. And they need a little bit more time to do that than we've been able to give them in the past and so dedicating a whole year for mechanical and dedicating a whole year for controls to really work out the kinks and the bugs and competing hopefully with both years once we've or with both year robots as we're kind of building on on our team and building year after year after year and hopefully making this team something that like in a few years time we have three robots that we could compete with if something goes wrong with one of them and kind of taking using our history to push ourselves forward. Do you have any resources at NASA that is helping you through your development process? Uh, we use a lot of, so our professor used to work for NASA, our, okay. Dr. Farrow, and he's kind of our advisor for, mechanic, for our mechanical teams, he's a mechanical Great engineering professor. To have. Oh yeah, he's an awesome resource and he really, he really helps us kind of think through, okay, does this really work? Is it simple? Is it, it's not too complex where if something goes wrong, the whole system just goes and doesn't work anymore. And it's not so simple that you're not actually co accomplishing anything, you know? You don't want to have like skis and no motors or anything. How's your robot going to move if it's just sitting there and not doing anything? So you need some complexity for a machine, but you don't want so much complexity that you don't understand what it's actually doing. So do you have like a sand pit to test your robots in? A simulated environment? Yeah, we have, we're actually trying to working on, right now we're working on a, um, trying to get sponsorship to make um, a more accurate test pit, but right now we have, uh, right now we just have sand 
in one pit and like a gravelly stony mixture in another pit. Okay. And so the sand, the sand is really to simulate that topsoil. This is about yay much of like top stuff that we want to get through. And in the other pit, we have the direct what we want, sort of. And they're not exact replicas of what we would be using in competition, but it's what we were able to get our hands on at the time. Um, and actually, we're working with another MSOE, um, like, sub, I, guess, I guess subsidiary. They, they're owned by MSOE, I guess, right? The RPC is uh, the rapid at MSOE ha uses uh, powder 3D printers. And the powder is very close in, like, like material material wise to what NASA uses for our competition. Okay. And so we're trying to use kind of the excess powder that they're not using anymore. They store it in these big drums and they're not using it really. And so we're trying to use that excess material as the topsoil and like getting a more sophisticated kind of testing environment. So you're the the dust you're trying to simulate, would that be more like moon dust or Mars dust? Uh, so we're trying to simulate more lunar, like moon dust, right now, just because the competition like focus has kind of shifted slightly. It started back in like 2009, 2010, to uh, as it started as lunabotics. Then it was all about getting to the moon, and everything was. Set. And after that, it went to the robotic mining competition, which focused more on Mars. Mm -hmm. And I, from what I've been told, like the the environments are similar enough that like they could get away with shifting the material slightly and it like it's sort of similar enough that sand works as a simulant in our case pretty well like it's not as dusty and powdery but for for our uses for just testing basic things like drivetrain stuff like that it worked and now they're going back to lunabotics which is again like on the moon and so the rpc or the <laughs> the other open, the rapid prototyping center all this dust is really close to this lunar lunar dust that we have samples of. Okay. All right, so lunar dust tends to be a little more coarse. It can kind of rip through material very yeah. well. So are you going to, are you planning for that? Are you going to design this to withstand the, uh, the, the qualities of that sand? This, this previous year when we designed this robot was really getting the main like systems like the drivetrain and the chassis and uh, like able to withstand the main forces that we would see like weights and like wind forces and like shock forces was the main development goal of this one and but for this redevelopment cycle we still are allowed to touch mechanical systems and kind of like tweak things here and there and so my worry for that course or sand as you're mentioning is like our electrical box isn't as sealed right. and is, isn't as structural as like the rest of this robot is like much more rigid than the electrical box really isn't and so kind of reinforcing that and making it a little bit more of like more more able to withstand as you're saying like this coarser gotcha. So it's, it's, all, it's all a development process is kind of what you know. So this is our um, 2019 year prototype, I guess, model of our robot. One by one and two by one tube aluminum. And it's all held together by uh, 16th inch aluminum gussets, all riveted. It's very sturdy. I mean, I, I, think, I think this thing could take a car crash and it wouldn't, it wouldn't budge. I mean, like you can feel this thing like real sturdy. Um, Are you using aluminum for the, it, the light qualities? Yes, yeah, it's light and it's, for, our, for our needs, it's very sturdy. I mean, we don't need this thing to be made out of just a block of steel, right? Right. And so having kind of this space frame of sorts where it's like just the minimum that we need. We have mounting points here, mounting points here, and down here we just have mounting points for our drivetrain. And so it's very simple to work with. We can just drill holes when we need to and kind of fill it in with gussets when we don't need holes. It's just very simple to work with and easy to manufacture. Uh, moving on to our collection bin, and so... Collection so we, bin, so that's for uh, the dust? Yeah, so you can't see here, this is where our bucket ladder would be, I'll show you in a minute. Okay. Uh, but this is where it would kind of cycle and start kind of spitting stuff into oh. here. Our, our main objective, rather, is to get this gravel from, that's like about yay deep down from, it's like here's the top soil where we're driving on, and it's deeper in there. So. We're planning on modifying this or modifying the way we do things in such a way that we can dump out all the collected just dust and only collect that gravel because we're only graded on the gravel that we collect and bring back to NASA. Okay. And so, as you can see, this is operated on just a lead screw and a motor down there. So as the lead screw spins, drives this guy up, up until here, which is on a pivot right down here. And so, when it gets to a certain point, the mass over here pivots it and dumps it into the, uh, the collection facility on, on the field. 
Uh, we're actually using hoverboard motors, you know, those things that kids use, they're kind of, yeah, for the drivetrain. We're using those, um, they're very torquey and for our application, they're very nice to drive this okay. pretty heavy robot. Yeah. And moving on to the back, this is just how we have it mocked up for, proto for prototyping and for demoing. Just our batteries on the back for easy access, just slap them on and off. In the future, these batteries will be mounted inside. We're actually working on expanding our electronics box, making it a little bit bigger so we have a little bit more room to do things in there. You would see at the uh, front of the robot, and this is what actually actuates. Right. It's got a motor inside here. You can actually see the control, the leads right here for the motor. Oh yeah. Are these all the mini scoops? Yeah, so this is, it's called a bucket ladder. And so yeah, what it yeah, does is it just that. spins and picks up dirt. It's held at a uh, 30 degree angle from, so like this is a 30 degree angle. Mm -hmm. So it's held like this and it plunges itself into the ground and oh. at that angle. And um, it so yeah, it just- scooping. What's that? And it starts scooping. Yeah, it's just, we drive it as it begins to scoop. So it's kind of picking up dust and creating a hole for itself as it goes down. So it's not, it's not trying to plunge into just this ground. Like we're not trying right. to use it like a pickaxe. Right. We're trying to use it as it's like clearing stuff as, and just let itself Ground it. go back down. Yep. yep. Okay. Uh, and what material is this made out of? Uh, this is three inch by one inch tube aluminum. <laughs> I know again with the tube aluminum. Yeah. Uh, but we had this custom uh, CNC'd actually by a uh, a shop that's in our school. We have a CNC machine okay. and, a, and a CNC machinist. And he machined this, so we have this whole exactly located, like position, everything on here is positioned very precisely because if it wasn't, this whole thing would be out of whack. It would kink up on the robot and it wouldn't drive itself into the ground. We also have parts. No, the buckets are aluminum as well. Yeah. And so this is, we actually had a sponsor for all of the gussets that you saw on the chassis and all of these buckets yeah. were manufactured by one of our sponsors, KSM Industries, got to give a shout out to them. Um, made these out of a 16th inch sheet aluminum and they welded them up and the welds look awesome. Yeah. If you're into metal at all, you know how difficult welding aluminum can be. Right. And for what it is, these, these guys did an awesome job. I'm Austin, uh, I'm currently the uh, project uh, manager for the team. But last year I was on the chassis and drivetrain uh, team as well as the treasurer. And so last year I basically headed up the um, design and fabrication of the wheel covers as well as some of the controls aspects for the drivetrains. The way that we integrate the hoverboard wheels or the hub motor wheels into our drivetrain, we need to uh, make a way to increase the depth of the wheel as well as the diameter of the wheel so that we can actually drive over this really uh, really fine dust surface right. without getting stuck. So we increased um, tread height by adding these uh, tall treads and then we realized that conventional uh, manufacturing methods would be really cost prohibitive yeah. to actually manufacture our design. So is that 3D we, printer? So this is 3D printed actually, nice. yes. And um, we 3D printed it in three sections so that we could run more printers at a time because we only have like one or two printers at our school that could actually print the entire wheel mm -hmm. or half of the wheel even at a time. Um, and then we have this uh, strap here to clamp down over the wheel uh, to add friction between the wheel and the cover. Um, there's also a groove in here that attaches to the wheel backing that we attach physically to the wheel. And so then we can just loosen up this screw, slide this over, and then tighten it down on the wheel so we can uh, take it off for display moments like this uh, where we want to drive it around on the hardwood floor. Because um, we really only attach this for competition. Mm -hmm. Um, so this replaces those little wheels, right? Yeah, there. those little wheels would not fare well in the uh, right. Russian environment. Yep. So um, we need sense. to... Uh, another great thing about 3D printing is this actually, believe it or not, is only 7% infill, which is like way low density. You would think that it'd be way too uh, fragile, but it's really not. It's a uh, good density for the for this application. What kind of material is it? And uh, PLA. PLA, okay. So, yep. Um, but that's like that's we, like sugar based, right? Yeah, it's a uh, corn cornstarch. I think is what makes it. Uh, do you think that's the right material for space? Uh, we would make it out of uh, 
ABS if we had access to ABS printers, but okay. for this competition, since we really we can bang these out pretty quick, yep. uh, we figure that if we do need to replace one, it's cheaper to just print more and replace them than uh, to have to go through the channels to get ABS printed for us. So, uh, so if this was spaceflight hardware, we would probably print it in ABS or or a better material than that, probably. Uh, but for this application, it's uh, it's more economical to print. Makes with sense. Absolutely. PLA.